here uh, ad hominems or attacks from your position or your side. I did want to bring this to your attention and get your response. Uh, after the panel that you appeared on with the late uh, Christopher Hitchens, you referred to him in an interview with Christian Radio as, quote, and this is on YouTube, Weasley, oily, and lacking in intellectual substance. You then referred to in your debate with Richard Carrier while he was there to him as a hack. You also referred to fans as Richard Dawkins in an interview, and this is also on YouTube. Dawkins is so po popular because he because people are so unsophisticated, inept, sophomoric, they cannot think logically, uninformed, silly, ignorant, and the result, and this is your words, of an educational system that has been dumbed down. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Ms. Craig, uh, quite frankly, is this hypocrisy or is this just a glimpse of the real William Lane Craig? Well, I, I, I think it's a glimpse of the real William Lane Craig. Uh, <laughs> um, I, no, no, I, I don't know that, but, but no, um, maybe it's important to describe what an ad hominem is. That means literally against the man. And what an ad hominem argument would be is that the reason you reject his conclusion is because you attack his person. Um, maybe like attacking me, you know, for these aspersions. No, wait, no, let me, let me finish. It, it would be like saying that my conclusions are wrong because I've said all of these nasty things. See, that would be an ad hominem argument. But in none of these cases that you've quoted where you've compiled words, uh, not strung together at once, but you put them together, in none of these cases, I think, will you find that I ever reject a person's argument or conclusions on that basis. Rather, these were probably said in response to questions like tonight, where I said some pretty negative things about uh, folks rejecting God for emotional reasons rather than intellectual reasons. And I would certainly reiterate what I said about the lack of sophistication and the dumbed-down educational system. But in no case is this committing an ad hominem fallacy where I say that their conclusions are wrong because of those things. I'm just, I've, I've been asked to characterize certain things as I was tonight, and I've given my honest characterization that I would stand by. I mean, I, I think it is, it is true, all of those things that I said, but it's not, a, it's not an ad hominem fallacy. At most, it would be impolite, maybe. You could indict me for being impolite, but... Thank you very okay. much. Okay. I appreciate that. Okay. My argument is not that belief in God is necessary in order to do good or live a moral life or be a decent chap. The argument has nothing to do about belief in God. The argument is that without God, there isn't any absolute standard of right and wrong. And therefore, what we call moral values are just the spin-offs of socio-biological evolution. Altruism, like you mentioned, self-sacrificial behavior, a mother rushing into a burning no, building. No, 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 specifically not a mother to save a child, because there's a perfectly good reason for a mother saving well, the child. Well, but if you think, if you say that, see, then again, you're, you're still misunderstanding my argument. What I was going to say is that on the socio-biological point of view, that kind of altruistic behavior is just the selfish gene wanting to perpetuate mm. itself, mm. and it's the same kind of behavior you see in a troop of baboons where you see what looks like altruistic behavior, or even in an ant heap, where fighter ants will sacrifice themselves for the good of the heap. M my point is that on the atheistic view, that's all moral values are. Is that right? Let's clear yeah, that up. I, I would like to Is ask there any difference, Lerner? You come back in one second, but let me just ask Lewis whether there is any difference between the altruistic behavior of a human being, somebody who may sacrifice him or herself, for a cause with, which will bring them no particular benefit, and, and, and a baboon. Well, there are, there are occasions where there are groups of animals where there's someone who will, sc will scream when danger comes, mm. and therefore all the thing. So these can be biologically determined, but also there's the whole complex of the nature of the sociology of the society and how different societies behave. And that's got nothing to do with God, that's complex sociology and biology. Oh. So and, exactly and who imposed the complex biology? Where did that come from? Well, evolution, because, evolution. Right. Yeah, we're back to the old... No, 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 see, that, that's my argument. That is all that moral values are on, on atheism. 
and that therefore, as I say, rape, child abuse, these yeah, may you be socially me. inconvenient, but, or, or so taboo. As an but atheist, I'm not a rapist. You're misunderstanding my argument. Of course yes. you're not. Thank you. you're, you're misunderstanding the argument. If, I'm not arguing that to be, be a good person, you have to believe in God. What I'm arguing is that without God, there is no absolute moral values, no absolute moral duties. We are like advanced primates, uh, and what we call moral values are just these ingrained socio-biological Patterns. Yes, that's exactly what they are. Okay, so, so that is your view. I was, I was not sure of that. Well, then you see, when you make these moral judgments yourself, you're, you're acting inconsistently with your own worldview. When you make moral judgments like wow. everyone has the right to believe whatever he wants so long as it doesn't interfere with others. Where do these, where does this notion of rights suddenly come from? The, the, that's just... History and sociology. Right, just sociologically ingrained yes. behavior. So the... Uh, the pedophile or the rapist or the psychopath or the person who wants to be uh, a, a religiously intolerant persecutor is just acting uh, out of fashion. He's like the person who belches no, not at a, a meal. Not, no, uh, Hitler wasn't acting out of fashion. He acted in his particular way which other people objected to. Right, but there wasn't anything morally wrong with what he did, right, on your view? Of course there was. It, well, it was just, uh, it was just contrary to uh, the patterns of socio-biological behavior that have been ingrained into the human species no. not to kill each other off. Why, why was what he did objectively wrong? Because it, made, it killed many people and made people extremely uh -huh. unhappy. All right, but now that goes on all the time in the animal kingdom, right? No. Killing other, other no, animals. No, that does not. Well, when a lion kills a zebra... Oh, when a lion kills a zebra... Kills it so to eat, it? What about when you kill your, 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 your turkey? Be careful yes. with turkeys at the moment. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, fine, use, use that example. Uh, on, on atheism, these are all morally neutral acts because there isn't any standard of right and wrong. Sure, there isn't. Okay, so, so <laughs> yeah, you agree with, 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 with claims. You had talked about okay. the idea of extraordinary claims require extraordinary mm -hmm. evidence. Yes, indeed. The question I've got is, what would that extraordinary evidence be in the first century? You didn't have video cameras, you didn't have scientific tests, so what would that look like? Uh, if there had been a video camera there at the, at the uh, do door of the tomb, you know, and we could see the angel coming down, rolling aside the, uh, the, the big stone, that sort of thing, uh, well, I would say probably, first of all, it was made in a Walt Disney studio. That would be my first hypothesis, uh, you know, that uh, Steven Spielberg had something to do with it, you know. This watchword, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, is really just an excuse for an a priori rejection of the miraculous, because you, you weren't, or you didn't give any sort of evidence that would satisfy you with respect to one of these extraordinary claims. It made it sound like, to me, you were saying, that nothing would convince you, oh, no matter no, what. No, all sorts of things would convince me. Well, with respect to the resurrection, though, I mean, you, you even said if there was a video camera, you'd say it was a fake stone that was mm. rolled away. You know, I mean, mm. what, what sort of... What be the, sort that would of, be the more reasonable hypothesis under the but, circumstances. Well, but see, that's what I fear. It is. It's, uh -huh. just an, it's just an a priori rejection of the miraculous here. You're, you're not... There isn't any kind of literary testimony, historical testimony that mm -hmm. could convince you. But, but you're saying that these, when you say extraordinary, really what you're saying is no amount of evidence would co convince me of these extraordinary claims. Sure it would. If uh, tomorrow morning, immediately after breakfast, suddenly there was an earthquake, you know, and a silvery light shone in the sky and the leaves dropped from the trees, and I dashed outside and there towering over us like a hundred Everest was this giant figure with lightning playing around his Michelangeloid face, and he pointed down and saying, Be assured, Keith M. Parsons, that I do in fact exist, and I'm sick of your logic chopping. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Craig, I would join you in the pew of the church, in the you, front pew of the church the next Sunday. Uh, you, uh, uh, so, uh, you know. Be going to the question and answer period. We're going to go to the question and answer period, so be going to the microphone you, as you we don't wind think, this down. You don't think that you would have said, Boy, I was having a hallucination. <laughs> <laughs> Not. <laughs> just, just think about the Muslims at this moment who are blowing themselves up, okay, convinced that they are agents of God's will. There is absolutely nothing that Dr. Craig can, can say against their behavior in moral terms 
apart from his own faith-based claim that they're praying to the wrong God. Okay, if they had the right God, what they were doing would be good on divine command theory. Now, I'm obviously not saying that all that Dr. Craig or all religious people are psychopaths and psychotics, but this to me is the, is the true horror of religion. Okay, it allows perfectly decent and sane people to believe by the billions what only lunatics could believe on their own. Okay, if you wake up tomorrow morning thinking that saying a few Latin words over your pancakes is going to turn them into the body of Elvis Presley, okay, you have lost your mind. Okay. But if you think more or less the same thing about a cracker and the body of Jesus, you're just a Catholic. Now, here again, I think atheists so often fail to realize that what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. The same point applies to Harris's view. Um, on the naturalistic view, uh, on atheism, plausibly there are no objective moral values and duties, and therefore millions and millions of people can engage in horrible and despotic acts, such as we saw in Marxist-Leninism or in Nazism in National Socialist Germany. And the same question could be posed of Harris. He thinks that the basis of objective moral values is the flourishing of sentient life. Well, I could say, but what if the flourishing of sentient life were not the basis for objective moral values? Then what? then you would have nothing to say other than your faith-based claim that the flourishing of setting at life is the basis of moral values. It's, it's the same thing that he accuses me of. Now, what I would say with regard to the Muslim is that the Muslim is worshiping a God who doesn't exist. There is no such person as Allah as described in the Quran. Uh, and therefore, we can be grateful that uh, moral values and duties are not determined by uh, Allah. Uh, rather, moral values are rooted in the essential nature of God himself, which is necessarily good, um, is not a result of human convention or arbitrary decision, and that uh, his commands to us reflect his necessarily good moral nature. So I think this provides a very firm, non-arbitrary, non-conventional basis for objective moral values and duties, something that I do not think atheism can do. I was going to talk a little bit more, but I'll just mention this. So I, I hosted a debate or discussion between Matt Flanagan and Joshua Thibodeau on the youth of road dilemma, which kind of touches on some of the issues, at least in the first part of this clip that Sam Harris was touching on. It's like these other religions, they believe these things. And if, if that was true, these would be really horrible things. But on divine command theory, this, this theory of ethics, it would seem to follow that these horrible things are therefore moral to do. And that just seems really weird. It's a bad, it's sort of an argument against divine command theory. So if you want to to hear a dialogue about some of those objections, check out that dialogue that I hosted. Did you want to say something on that? Not further. I think what okay, I've I heard you take said, a breath. Uh, pertain, pertains to the point. Okay, yeah. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting things to, that, that Matt Flanagan in that debate points out. So I just uh, recommend that you check that out. I did want to say something else, though, about the, the end of it. He says that... that you know, religion can make otherwise sane people believe insane things. And I want to say that science can make otherwise smart people believe some insane things, quote unquote, insane things. And all that we mean by that is that there are some claims that have a very low prior probability. Just on the face of it, they seem really weird. Okay. Take a scientific example. Atomic theory implies that most of the things that we interact with are made up mostly of empty space. That seems like an insane thing to believe until you start to gather evidence for atomic theory. In quantum mechanics, we, there's a thing called quantum entanglement, where two different particles, even uh, we have a lot of evidence now that this happens across vast dis uh, distances, where two particles can, it can start to do some of the same things faster than the speed of light. There's this sort of spooky action at a distance, according to, uh, that's what I, Albert Einstein said about it. And so we, there's things that we discover in science that just seem wacky on the face of it, but really what matters and this is the same thing when it comes to Christianity religion, really what matters is not the prior probability of something, 
but the evidence for it and whether or not we have good reasons to think that thing is true in the long run. Yes. Key to Harris's statement or argument, uh, and the audience may have missed this, was the word faith-based. He characterized the theistic view as faith-based, which suggests there isn't any evidence for it. But as you say, Cameron, if we have good evidence for the existence of God and for grounding moral values in God, um, then you escape his criticism. Uh, on the contrary, I think it's Harris's view that is faith-based. I can't think of any reason on a naturalistic, atheistic view for thinking that the flourishing of sentient life is somehow morally valuable. Now, Dr. Atkins says, I know of no evidence that the resurrection did take place. But there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday following his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was discovered empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian scholar who has specialized in the study of the resurrection, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic of Vanderbilt University, Gaut Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Luke Johnson, a New Testament scholar at Emory University says, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar concludes, that is why as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again leaving an empty tomb behind him. There is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these three facts. Therefore, it seems to me the Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. Dr. Dr. Craig, uh, um, you, you, you believe that the uh, testimony of, to the resurrection of Christ uh, is, 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 is something which uh, is historically uh, Im impossible or simply difficult to contradict? I wouldn't say impossible. In matters of history, we don't talk in terms of absolutes, but I would say that there are those three established facts, which... And not established facts. I'm sorry, they are, they are repetitions of what is written in the Bible. Well, in so far as you say that, Dr. Like Atkins, you drones. disagree with the majority of New Testament historians who say that these facts do belong to the portrait of the historical Jesus. But most of the historical his, the historians of the New Testament are believers themselves and are desperate for it to be true. And they make it true by assertion. I think they, that's a they, very they naive view of they New Testament criticism. They, they certainly today. cannot prove that it is true. Not in the sense of a mathematical proof, yeah. but in the sense of a historical proof. Can we prove that Caesar was killed? It, well, exactly. It's the same sort of no, proof we're talking about. It's not that there were, there were real witnesses to Caesar's death. Uh, what there were, there were, the, and on, on the day that it happened, there, and there were no witnesses that um, on the day that it happened, it happened, what happened on the day that um, Ju Jesus purported to die. Now, you're not, you're not denying that the crucifixion of Jesus was therefore a historical fact, are you? 
it's quite likely he was um, crucified, at least someone was. Yes, okay, and now, uh, was he then buried by Joseph of Arimathea, as the okay. Gospels report? Well, that's what they wrote 80 years later, but I can't remember uh, not who, 80 who years. buried my mother. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, but, maybe there was no, maybe it was no reason to memorialize that, yeah. that burial. It, the, I think it's important to understand that the New Testament critics who look at the New Testament are not, as you say, these biased believers desperate to believe in this. German New Testament criticism, which I yeah. have done my doctoral work in, is enormously skeptical and enormously uh, influenced by the same anti-miraculous presuppositions that you evinced. And yet, the majority of critics today have found themselves driven to accept the facts of the empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus. And the appearances and the, of what, there were what, 87,000 appearances of Elvis last year, weren't there? Uh, what I, I don't think that... Uh, princess Di, I mean, yes. the people, she is going to be the, Princess Diana is going to be the next person to be... Now, wait, but now, now, now you're, are you admitting, though, now that there, they did have these experiences of appearances, but that they were hallucinations? I can believe that there are two possibilities. One is that they were hallucinations, that they, re they really so missed their leader that yes. they were desperate to see him. And uh, they just invented... This, um, this, this, this well, do, do, do you The know, other is that it's just a straightforward you know lie. 12, you know 12 people who uh, are prepared to commit their lives to the uh, apparition of Elvis, even to the point of uh, suffering, uh, suffering um, hideous deaths? Um, <laughs> I, I think that if I, and I note your impartiality in this debate, it's very <laughs> impressive. Um, Well, uh, I, I, I think that if I took 12 simple fishermen wandering around the banks of um, uh, the, the Galilee, I think that they would look for something that they could devote their lives to. No. These were simple, simple like folk. Paul. Uh, he wasn't one of the <laughs> let, uh, let well, okay, let me pick on you. Oh, well, uh, that's no, better. Uh, About Dr. time Craig. to with, Dr. A, Dr. with a real Craig. question, too. Why, why, um, uh, why, if everything you say is correct, isn't, doesn't the implicit logic of what you say totally command uh, the uh, academic community? Why is there so much skepticism if what you say is, to use his word, so manifestly correct? Well, I, I never said it was manifestly correct. I think you can argue about any of these points, but I think that on balance, the premises are more plausible than their negations. Take, take the first argument that I gave. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. It seems to me that only a presuppositional antipathy toward theism would cause someone to reject those premises. Well, this, 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 this strikes you as extremely clear. Why doesn't it strike other people as extremely Well, as I say, I think some folks have an antipathy toward like theism, is. like Dr. Well, Atkins. I mean, but, it's so evident see, that, that he's got his mind made up when he said, what are the possibilities for explaining these resurrection appearances? Hmm. The possibilities were lying or hallucinating. It wasn't even a possibility that they were telling the truth that well, God really had done this. Well, in other words, it, it, it's yeah. ruled out in advance. Well, I, I, I think it's so unlikely that anything like that could happen that you have to look at the simpler explanations first. Go for the simpler explanation. Only if the simpler explanation uh, fails and is explicitly shown to fail, go to the more complicated I, I agree. I agree entirely with that. But and the breakdown of the laws of nature by the intrusion of the finger of God is not a simple way of proceeding. That you're misusing the criterion of simplicity. Uh. That's not what simplicity means. It means don't multiply causes beyond necessity. And in this case, the hypothesis that these men were lying or were hallucinating is simply uh, implausible, given their willingness to die for their beliefs, which shows in sincerity, and given the un-Jewish nature of the yeah. belief that they came to hold, which couldn't have been the product of their own imaginations. People go for a living death by throwing themselves into nunneries and into monasteries. But they believe that it's true. They believe doing. it's true, but All they're right. wasting their lives because of it. But the, the point is that they really sincerely believe it. They're not lying. And that was yeah. the, the point that was being made here before. So these 12 fishermen also believed it. Okay, so, so you're willing to admit they weren't lying. I can, believe, I can, I, I can accept that if 
it is true, then it is possible that they were not lying. Okay, so then but these were simple-minded people. They weren't, and they were surrounded by a, a miraculous events said to be going on. Maybe they just wanted to join in for the notoriety of the of being involved in in in, in amazing events. But there were people who were bored. You and think that there they... wasn't there, there wasn't much to do in Palestine at the time. <laughs> So they invented the resurrection of Jesus and endangered well, their no, lives because yes. they were bored? Well, no. <laughs> uh, 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 uh.